Right. I hope you can see my screen. Can you? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, for our webcast on uh, Beyond COVID-19. See how we can jumpstart the new world as we move into the new business and economy. So welcome, everybody. for And my name is Eugene, and I'm the, I'll be your co-host today. I'm the founder and the CEO for SSD Consulting, and I'm also the chair for One Africa Network, which is one of the leading uh, network for African professionals, business leaders, and the uh, professionals within the Midland, but now expanding across the UK and Africa. And I'm also the chair and the president of African Business Chamber, which we recently launched in, in back in January in Birmingham to support African businesses within the UK. And I'll be supported my, by my colleague who's online, Dennis Aguma, who's also a partner and a consultant at SSD Consulting and a co-chair at One Africa Network. And he's also a visiting lecturer at Birmingham City University on enterprise and the entrepreneurship ecosystem. So before we, we deep dive into the discussion today and the agenda, I just wanted to give you a brief about One Africa Network for those who, are who doesn't know more about One Africa Network. So as mentioned, we are the leading network for African entrepreneurs, business leaders, and professionals within the Midian. Our commitment is mainly advancing entrepreneurship, innovation, excellence, inclusiveness, and sustainable economic development through various initiatives by connecting people, inspiring and empower our members to, to grow and to thrive in the economy. So over the last few, the last two years, we've been hosting several meetings across the Birmingham, engaging various leaders and the stakeholders and in the economy to look at some of the challenges and the possible opportunities and the solution to support the minority communities within the UK. And these are some of the speakers we've hosted in the last few months from various economy ranging from Bank of England to various corporate companies to various academia. And so we host various um, speakers to share their perspective and thoughts and how we can uh, empower the minority community. So these are some of the activity we do. So today the focus will be how can we move beyond COVID-19 as the majority of you are already aware we are already planning to go beyond the crisis to see how we can jumpstart the economy. But to, to kind of set the scene, where we are, we, are more, we are coming from in terms of some of the shifting trajectory, some of the major disruption and trend we've seen in the last few months and which has brought us where we are today. First of all and foremost, COVID-19 has been a tragedy for millions of people. I thought to everyone who's been affected and I hope everyone on the line is well and safe and healthy. And of course, it's a threat to due to our livelihood and business and the economy, we are already predicting the UK economy to shrink by, I think, 30 to 35% with a job loss of around 15%. 15 and of course, there is the other implication in terms of many businesses are, are being threatened and they are currently on survival mode and so many disruption in, within the supply chain. We're looking at it various cancellation of major activities across the globe. Recession guarantee, depending who you talk to, recovery, we don't know when. And we've seen so many changes in terms of policy making at many companies, including the government, so much changes. In the, and of course, the, the stock market has been very unpredictable in the last few weeks, including the price, the oil price, which has been up and down over the last few weeks. And of, and of course, out of all that, remote and the home working digital economy has taken the center stage, including other things, but not to forget, people well-being at the moment is a, is a concern in terms of how we move forward. So this is the journey we've been, we are going through at the moment, and I'm sure majority of you, you are, you are familiar with the 
the journey we are in at the moment but we as we look for recovery so there will be quite a lot of key consideration so today the agenda is very quite simple and the objective is to provide update uh, practical action and guidance to businesses and pro entrepreneurs and who are currently listening and who will be joining us to to hear what they can take away to help them navigate the current situation as they prepare for recovery so these are the some of the topics and we've received quite a lot of questions in advance which i'm i'm hoping we'll be going through them but before let me just uh, welcome our speaker. From the left, we have Paul Forrester from West Midland Economic Forum, who will give us, who will set the scene in terms of the economic landscape, some of the shift we've seen in the, in the last few months and how he, his perspective on how the future economy look like. Second, and unfortunately, Mark has just sent me a message to say, He's been not feeling well the, this afternoon, so he's unable to join us. So our, our apology, his past is apology. Third, we have Dr. Domboka, who is a, a senior lecturer and a professor at a Birmingham City Business School. Fourth, we have Professor Piers from Warwick Business School. And we also have Dr. Diane Laini. Um, I hope she can hear us also who's the founder and the CEO of Diane Line. We'll give everyone an opportunity to introduce themselves. And we have Dr. Carl, um, who's the founder and the director for Governance Forum. And the second and final, not, not the last, we have the Dr. Lochelle, founder and of Crowd uh, Potential Consulting and also a lecturer at the University of West England. And finally, we have Coyote, um, Chief Investment Officer for Trinity Asset Management. So welcome everybody. Before we kick off, probably instead of introducing, because there have been quite a lot of shift and changes, I'm not sure the biography I have here is correct. Maybe some of the position might have changed or the situation. If I, if I give everyone uh, uh, two, three minutes to introduce themselves in terms of who they are, what they do, and give a bit of overview in terms of how the current crisis has disrupted their business or work as usual before we deep dive into the discussion. So if I start with Paul, Paul, uh, yes, uh, I, I run the West Midlands Economic Forum or the Midlands Economic Forum when we're across, across the um, um, A5. Uh, basically, we just try and put the um, Midlands economy in a global context. Uh, before I worked in the Midlands, I used to work in the City of London um, as a country risk analyst working for various international institutions. And so I suppose I've been covering Africa for about 30 years. And before selling me soul to work in the city of London. I worked in Papua New Guinea for about six years as an as a economic research officer. Um, but in terms of what's happening with the, with, the, with the economy at the moment, it's actually really difficult to, to try and pinpoint what's happening, other than that there seems to be a very big downturn. The real problem is there's so little economic data. Uh, first of all, because the people that actually collect the economic data in the Office of National Statistics can't actually do so at the minute. Uh, if you look at the inflation data, they can't collect cinema tickets because nobody's going to the cinema tickets, nobody's going to football matches and nobody's going to pubs. So they're having to um, postulate what the uh, inflation is. Shall I just say a few words where I think the economy is going at the minute? Yes, please, if you can give a bit of that would be good. I think the, 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 first, the first point is to, to note how it appears that the, the government's completely mishandled this situation and this probably has led to tens of thousands of more deaths than should have actually been sustained and it's still quite chaotic. It has really to control what's happening with the virus, which is, could be here for centuries, let alone another two or three years. Um, they haven't done testing and isolating and, and tracking down where the virus is. But the big problem is we spent the last decade um, terrified that if we breached the 
what was called Professor Rogoff's debt intolerance level of 90% of GDP. We spent the last 10 years doing austerity, trying to bring that down. Um, when, we, when we started on the financial crisis, the debt stock was about 33% of GDP. When we left the financial crisis, it was 62%. And after two, after 10 years of austerity, we've managed to reduce it to 79% of GDP. So austerity was obviously a real success. So as we enter this current crisis, the debt stock is about 80% of GDP. The current forecasts are that we'll add another 30 percentage points in terms of GDP, in terms of the size of the debt stock. So we should be looking at a, a public sector debt of about 110 to 120 percent of GDP within the next two years. We can't obviously have another austerity program to actually start reducing that, that stock of debt or whether it's actually important. And so we're going to have to come up with a new economic rationale of doing it. At the same time, as the government is stretched for, for, for resources to bail out the rest of the economy, it looks like the banks are going to be hit as well. I think one of the examples is yeah, uh, in April, 871 new cars were sold throughout Britain. That compares with 69,873 the previous, the previous April. And one of the big weaknesses of the banks is it lent something like £2 billion in these personal contracts for cars. Uh, similarly, in terms of leveraged loans, the Bank of England calculated to have about £98 billion worth of exposure. And that's before we start talking about emerging market debt defaults, such as Argentina and possibly some in Africa. So we're not able to bail out the banks again. So it's going to take some quite innovative thinking how to get uh, through this crisis. And it's really going to demand sort of non-monetary and non-fiscal measures and perhaps organisational organizational measures. The Bank of England came out with an estimate on what the things the contraction in GDP is going to be. They think it's going to have contract about three three to four percent in the first quarter and possibly twenty five percent in the second quarter. Overall they see that the actual contraction in GDP about fourteen percent. That means in the second half of the year you're going to have to have the strongest recovery recorded since William the Conqueror probably came um, and they're looking at probably grow, a growth rate of probably I don't know 10 or 15 percent in the second half of the year which is probably unsustainable so we're basically we're in a really difficult situation. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that brief uh, intro and uh, a bit overview in terms of the economic status at the moment but I'm hoping probably with a deep dive into some of those uh, issues you just pointed out as we discussed. So if I go to our next speaker, Dr. Domboka, if you can hear, if you can introduce yourself and also give us a, an overview in terms of how the situation has been on your side and the, some of the disruption you've seen in the last few weeks or months. Okay, thank you very much and um, hello everybody. Um, yes, uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I am originally from Zimbabwe. That's where I was born and that's where I grew up. And then I migrated, I moved to the UK, uh, where I've been, uh, which has become my home for the past 18 to 20 years uh, now. Um, I come from um, an industrial or commercial background. Before I became an academic, I spent much of my working life uh, working in um, in different kind of uh, industries, uh, some very small, some very large, uh, some multinational. And when I moved to the UK, I went into academia. Um, now, in academia, I'm working at Birmingham City University, where I am uh, working uh, as um, an associate professor, uh, and um, I manage or I lead our entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, module uh, and I also manage our um, uh, international MBA program which is quite a, a big program at the present moment because we're putting a enrollment of uh, over 200 students uh, from uh, from overseas. Now we did not see this coming uh, that's first comment that I should make uh, this COVID-19 we first heard about it early in the year 
But for many of us, and I believe for many of the panelists and uh, many people up and down the country, they would agree with me that when we first heard of COVID, it was more of uh, a Chinese problem or a Chinese issue in that it was not going to reach us. And if it was going to reach us, it was going to reach us uh, in a very modest way. Um, so in terms of preparation, we did not make any uh, preparations or any much preparation at all. Uh, within my own uh, work area as a university, and I think with also with many other universities, we have been a little bit uh, relaxed in terms of uh, how we've been rolling out like online programs, online courses, online training. Uh, in the case of my university, because it's been a very traditional university, which was doing things in a very traditional, old fashioned way. Uh, so when we had the, uh, the new director of business school coming in and saying that we need to introduce 25% of our courses to go online, or at least 25% of our teaching to go online, to some of us it was kind of, uh, well, it's a far-fetched dream, that's not gonna happen anytime soon. And, um, and this was early in the year. But now look where we are. Uh, we are in this situation uh, where we never, none of us uh, never anticipated to be in this situation uh, way back in, um, in March. Uh, but one of the things that I would say uh, has come out of this uh, situation we are in is opportunities for training and retraining employees, whether they're the entrepreneurs, we have had to learn uh, quite fast. Uh, this has been uh, an imposed change. Uh, I know there's a lot of literature that talks about, you know, the different phases of change, but this is a change that just happened uh, all of a sudden. And we had to learn new skills. Speaking of myself, I, I did not know how to deliver a lecture online. Uh, let alone a live one online. I didn't know that. Uh, but now I'm getting there within just over a month or so. I'm getting there and we are starting to we'll be teaching again uh, from June and we are expected to deliver all the content online and I'm perfecting my skills. So what I'm trying to say here is uh, whilst the COVID has brought uh, with it a lot of challenges for businesses, for a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, but uh, there's also need to look at it also from a positive uh, point of view, maybe it's a, as a wake up call in terms of uh, what is it that we do in this period. Now, when you come out of this tunnel, which I'm sure we are all in this tunnel, when you come out of this tunnel and we look back, what would we then say we have achieved or we have done in this, in this period? So it's an opportunity for, uh, for workers uh, to upskill themselves or to retrain uh, or to gain new skills. It's an opportunity for entrepreneurs to reflect on their businesses, their business models, what they've been doing, what they're doing, and then to devise and to come up with the new business models because things are not going to be the same when you come out of this tunnel. So that's in a nutshell, that's what I would say uh, for now. And then uh, we can talk a bit more later. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Domboka, for that brief introduction. And of course, also uh, highlighting some of the thought-provoking transformation that has been going on through, throughout the crisis for some people while we are in lockdown. So if I go to Dr. Lee and also to introduce herself and also give a bit of brief about her background and, and how the situation has been. Hi, Leon. Dian, can you hear me? Hi, Dian. Hold on. Hello? Oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I thought you had me just to give a bit of an introduction, your background and how the situation has been, some of the dynamics in your, in your area or some of the disruption you've encountered. Um, well, I, I, I wear two hats. So um, as a psychologist, I've, I've been obviously extremely busy um, from a mental health perspective. Um, my calls have gone up 
a lot in regards to people feeling isolated, anxious, um, very concerned about the future. Um, obviously, he says we've got a lot of people who lost their jobs. And so that has caused them quite a lot of anxiety. Um, so it has been a real learning curve um, and new methods. So everything is virtual. So I, um, but for me, I must say, six months ago, I created a virtual um, counseling room. So it was really ironic. Um, I'd already set up everything beforehand with obviously not knowing what was around the corner. Um, so from that perspective, it's been a learning curve because of the volume, but um, it's been um, an interesting way to engage with people, but obviously when you can't do face-to-face. -face. Um, from a business side, I have um, offices internationally. Um, and what I have seen is obviously their budgets have been cut quite significantly. Um, so it's all been about regrouping and, and the way forward and to really explain to people in regards to marketing and all those kinds of areas that it is about planning for the change and seeing what we can do to diversify um, and look at new ways and technologies to keep their businesses thriving. Um, and what it has done for a positive thing, it's really got people to really reevaluate, look outside the box, um, and new opportunities have come about um, because of this. Um, so overall, I, I, I think mine's a very 50-50. Obviously, it's not the best situation to be for, um, um, if you look at the economy, it, it's, it's down and there are gonna be many people who are not gonna um, recover from this for a while. Um, but it also has brought new opportunities. Um, and it's just about more from a technology point of view. Um, the new technology, like you said, people are using Zoom and Teams and all these different um, platforms that they'd never thought of before or never thought. And, and in some ways it's going to save businesses the way in the way future how they do do business so um yeah it, it's been an interesting it's been a very interesting time yeah. uh, thank you dr diane for that brief introduction and clearly you must be a busy person especially if you're working on the mental health aspects especially now with lots of concern of people well-being on the line and the, a lot of companies concerned uh, if I go to Dr. Carl, welcome Carl, and if you also can introduce yourself and also give a bit of um, background on some of the things you've been doing and also shed some light, some of the things you, you've you come across in the last few weeks or months from the boardroom aspect, especially working with corporate leaders, some of the changes you've you've seen in, in the as part of the COVID crisis. Okay, good evening everyone. Um, I'm excited to be talking about corporate governance, which is the area that I get tingly about. So to let the audience know that I get tingly about corporate governance. Does that make me a bit of a weirdo? We'll find out in a short while. Uh, my background is I'm an accountant by profession. I ran my own practice for nearly 20 years and then started to specialize in corporate governance about 10 years ago. So but I've sat on many boards from the chambers of commerce to small charities in the church, right up to very large corporates. So I specialize in the whole area of corporate governance and getting board members trained up, making sure that they understand what good governance is and getting organizations to understand what good governance is also. Uh, one of the programs that I deliver uh, has been delivered in 11 countries around the world. I spend a lot of time in the Middle East delivering that program. Um, and we've had over a thousand delegates go through my EBM program, which has been endorsed by Sir Adrian Cadbury, who wrote the, uh, the Cadbury Code. It's been endorsed by the Chartered Institute of Secretaries, my 12 principles of governance. And I also work with people from the private, public, and voluntary sector from the very smallest organizations to the very large corporates, as you mentioned, Eugene. 
Um, today, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was what boards are gonna do, because I think we should be able to prevent, detect, mitigate, learn from any crisis. And we're definitely in an unprecedented time. And I can remember at the beginning of the year when we did our annual away day for my business, that we talked about the fourth industrial revolution. We talked about the way the internet of things and artificial intelligence and cybersecurity and all of those, the machine learning, all those things that we're aware of are changing the way we work, live and play. And we put it into our strategic plan that we're gonna to have to work differently. And coincidentally, um, about two weeks before the lockdown, I did a TED talk, which was about the future boardroom and about the next generations, generation X, Y, and Z in the boardroom. And finally, a couple of weeks before that, I was in Dubai, who want to be the industrial capital of the world for the fourth industrial revolution, talking about the future boardroom. Now, I'm gonna say something embarrassing now, because having done all of that, when I went into lockdown, I'd never done a Zoom meeting before, I'd never worked on any of the things that we spoke about in my business plan, and it's devastated 80% of my business because my training courses, my one-to-one, -one, I get paid for standing up and speaking to people. I've licensed my products to other people to do the same thing. So all of a sudden, my business was devastated. Um, I'm happy to say four weeks later, I'm a Zoom master. Um, I've been online and learning all about Zoom and webinar jams and WebExes and all kinds of things, delivered loads of presentations. And the reason I say that, because the world is changing, there's going to be a new norm, and we've all got to get to grips with the new norm that that's going to take. A couple of things I'll talk about is, number one, leadership. I think leadership is going to change the way we lead. Number two, governance structures are going to have to change. Number three, we're gonna to have to tap into cognitive diversity and find talent from all over the place. And then finally, we're gonna find a way to decide and act appropriately in this new world. Um, and I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, thank you, George, for that brief introduction. I'm sure we'll come back to you because I know the last, the, this crisis has been like firefight in the boardroom to try to get some rapid decision moving and. Uh, uh, I'm, as a consultant, also I've been working for a few companies who, where the, the the situation has been crazy to get some last minute changes and uh, and also we 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 probably let alone talk about if the current crisis is likely to spearhead or fast track uh, inclusive readership within the boardroom. But if I go to our next speaker, Professor Piers, nice nice to see you. If you can introduce yourself also and give a, a bit brief about your background because unfortunately I can't go through any profile because the situation has been moving so I don't want to miss no introduce um, anybody. <laughs> okay, um, hello, uh, it's a real privilege to be here. I'm mostly here I hope to listen and learn is my main objective. Um, I see there are so many people on here and I'm, I'm already uh, ready to learn, ready to listen. So uh, I, whether I've got much to add to your own experiences, I don't know. Um, I'm an associate professor uh, in the Department of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Warwick University Business School, WBS. Um, and uh, I've been very interested all my career, mostly in issues around communication and leadership. I had a very odd career. I had spent a lot of time working in the arts. I was a uh, in the performing arts for 25 years as an actor and director and I had 25 years as a consultant uh, doing training and development and leadership development with businesses all around the world focusing mostly on communication skills and leadership but using models and ideas from theatre practice um, uh, to you know create and develop leaders um, and since the last five years I've been at University of Warwick uh, trying to tie some of that experience in with uh, you know academia um, I've had a really interesting time during lockdown. The universities had to change everything, put everything online virtually overnight. Um, we have gone from teaching face-to-face -to, -face to teaching online in an instant. Um, 
I too have been very intrigued by the things that, that Carl was talking about previously, how quickly I have had to adapt to this kind of interaction. Um, I think basically, I think, let me, let, me, let me just jump to the point. I think I would say there are three areas, three C that I've noticed about what's happening at the moment and things that might help to think about and how we move forward. Um, I've ended up with lots of C's, communication, changes in that and how important that is when you're leading through a crisis. Creativity, I think the, uh, during an emergency things emerge, we are all having to firefight, do things suddenly, very little opportunity to plan and consider. Ironically, paradoxically, those kind of pressures can often lead people to be very brave, inventive, take risks, um, make decisions that they otherwise wouldn't do because of necessity, but also to find solutions. So there is a, there's an upside to the uh, potential chaos of what be, we've been facing. Um, the other thing I've noticed is around connections and how, uh, in terms of communication, I personally have noticed how the quality of the relationships I have with uh, my family and friends, obviously, but also um, my work and professional relationships, the quality of those has changed because of things like this way of talking to people. There's a kind of informality um, around Zoom, which I, I personally like very much. I've noticed uh, that our departmental meetings have become much more informal. We're sharing news. There's uh, some really positive changes there, but also that my world has shrunk. I'm spending far more time connecting with um, a smaller group of people and my opportunities to network more widely are less and different in form like this, very different in form to where I would normally be networking. And finally, uh, uh, I, I guess putting those three things together, I would say that uh, what I've observed is there's a lot to learn from the people who have been leading us through the crisis to date. I'm thinking particularly about uh, the different ways in which different countries and leaders have, have dealt with the crisis. I'm very intrigued by how um, uh, Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, has tackled it. Uh, I think she's a model in many ways of great communication in crisis. And I'd urge you to just have a look at what she's been up to, how she's approached it. Um, and also I'm intrigued by the fact that organizations, that countries and uh, responses led by women have been particularly successful. And I think there's something to be learned there from the way in which those female leaders have tackled this crisis, which might be different from the way in which men have tackled it. And there may be something to learn there that we can all take forward about effective leadership and effective communication in crisis. So that's, that's me for now. Yeah. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing from everybody else. Welcome, Piers, and thank you for that brief introduction and also taking down into some of the three C's that you've learned in the last in the lockdown. So if I go next to Rochelle, Rochelle, how are you? I'm uh, if you can introduce yourself and also give us a bit of brief in terms of some of the things you've been seeing in, from a HR perspective, and probably yeah. let alone we'll deep dive into some what does this mean as we go through um, the new, new world where the remote economy and gig economy will come in? Yeah. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm a senior lecturer at the University of the West Indies. Uh, not West Indies, sorry, West of England. <laughs> University of the West Indies is where I went to university. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm originally from Barbados. Um, so uh, in addition to being a in your lecture, I'm also the founder and CEO of a consulting firm called Crowd Potential. And about two months ago, we um, released, not two months actually, it's February, we released the findings of a global study that we were carrying out for the last um, year and a half. And this global study was about the changing world of work and changing expectations of work. So we released that study in February, and we would have never thought that a lot of the things that we said within the study would have been so prophetic. Um, what we were, what some of the key findings in the study stated was that the, the world of work was changing and there was a current clash between the way in which um, businesses were managing their human capital and talent versus um, the changing work expectations of, let's say, um, the different generations, but also different types of workers. And one of the things that we said was being ignored was um, 
the, the effective management of remote working as well as the growing tide of invisible online workers. Um, so at the time, we, we, there was 44% of the globe was working remotely and literally since we've released that study, that's gone from 44% to 80%. And during that time, uh, we, when we did the study, our results predicted, our results, sorry, um, highlighted the fact that 84% of businesses were failing in their business transformation. Because as some of the speakers highlighted before, also, always the concentration is on the type of digital technology in terms of machine learning, AI, um, cyber security, and so forth, um, as opposed to the human side and, and the human interaction with, with the digital world. So, when we released these findings, we could not have predicted that we would all have been in lockdown and working remotely um, a month later. So in terms of my world of work, it's really accelerated and my life has become quite busy, not only from adjusting to full-time remote work and as a lecturer, but also from the consulting and now speaking to a lot of companies about remote working and digital transformation. Um, so one of the things um, that we, are really pressing to businesses is that in this current context, this is not the normal remote working approach. And this is some of the reasons that a lot of businesses are um, experiencing um, a lot of, let's say, mental health fallout and a lot of challenges because it's, they're trying to recreate the office environment within um, the current situation, within the remote working context. But this isn't normal remote working. You now have a situation, as some of the speakers said as well, uh, of persons working at home with their children, persons not used to feeling isolated and so forth. So uh, because of that human element that's being missed, that sort of compassion and consideration for those um, surrounding circumstances, a lot of businesses are finding themselves frustrated through the lack of productivity or through, let's say, individuals having to now take time or them having to manage mental health issues. So. We very much, in terms of future trends, one of the things that we had said in the study was we had called for a widening of the talent lens. And um, I think it's, it's a Dr. Carl Jarge, you mentioned earlier with regards to um, the need to look for talent in different areas. And one of the things we had said was that, uh, whereas companies were saying previously that there is a, a real war for talent and they can't find the right talent uh, within the current business environment, at the time we were saying that it's not that you can't find the right talent, the fact is that your lens or um, your consideration of talent is still concentrated on the full-time traditional employee, whereas the world of work and our workforce has become so blended a change that you're now working with independent workers, part-time workers, full-time workers, robots working next to humans, and the mix of managing these different types of workers and elements were not really being considered. So one of the things we said in the white paper that we released was that there was a real clash between the work expectations of this growing blended workforce and the current ways of managing the workforce. So we spoke about the need for a new human capital management strategy, which we called gig HR, where you consider the needs of different types of workers and not just assume every type of worker will have those same needs of current the current full-time employee and in business and management literature a lot of the human resource management practices that we promote and highlight were designed within that context of the traditional full-time employee but whereas the context has changed so rapidly and the, the type of workers have become so expanded businesses are really failing when they're concentrating just on the digital transformation, but forgetting that that new type of workforce, there are varied needs within that type of workforce. So I'm going to stop there for now, but that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. Thanks, Rochelle. Clearly, you've highlighted some of the things that I think um, World Economic Forum and World Bank, they published a paper two years ago warning companies to prepare that within around 2025, digitization is likely to displace millions of people as company automized but now COVID-19 has just accelerated everything and brought it forward so probably as we recover you will see a lot of some of the laws disappearing some of the jobs and some of the people working from home maybe will never go back again into so it's an opportunity which has been highlighted by some of the speaker to use this current crisis as an opportunity to transform, learn new skills or realign. And let me first um, go to the last speaker and then we can go into some of the quest questions we have on the list. 
if I go, if I, Coyote, if you also can introduce yourself and give a bit of brief in terms of some of, of the project you've been working on. I remember last time we spoke, you are, you are excited about HS2 project and some investment uh, opportunity coming up within the mid-range. Is it the situation still the same or are you seeing more the change in the landscape or what's the situation on your side? All right, good evening everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear. Wonderful. So my name is uh, uh, Kaodi and you know, prior to going into the world of investing, I finished from Aston Business School, so pretty much uh, um, from me. So I spent some years consulting and straight after consulting, I decided to do something different. So my role in consulting at the time was helping companies save a lot of cost and trim the, the waste. So it was a lot of process improvement and process automa automation. So I was the bad guy that would come in and you know, tell them we don't need that guy because um, he's costing the business and it's waste. So um, from there, I decided to go into to, to property. I started to work with a company called Trinity Assets. I'm the CIO, so Chief Investment Officer. So the business pretty much focuses on acquiring stock and developing stock. So a lot of the stock we typically acquire is we would in inject our DNA, increasing the value. And most of the stock we develop is, is across the West Midlands. So we tend to operate in the hospitality space, retail, and our bread and butter, about 80% of our stock is residential. So we focus on the young, exciting um, millennials, if you will. Uh, we tend to house a lot of these guys. And also we tend to focus on a B2B um, housing. So we tend to house a lot of, of staff to work for companies like HS2, BMW, and we, we, we tend to focus on the resident, the hospitality side of things. So this is the guest houses and this guest houses have no staff. So that's pretty much our business. And we focus in heavily on the, on the Birmingham region because so much, so much happening as Eugene was saying. So, I mean, how does, how does this affect our business? I'll say it's very hard to say at this point in time in terms of the, the massive effect. But what I can say is a lot of people in the hospitality space and, and our businesses has been impacted slightly because a lot of people have stopped going to, you know, exhibitions, uh, the lot of tourists are not traveling. So that, that kind of space is pretty much very flat. There's no lot of improvement there. But well, one thing we started to do as a business is to work with a lot of key workers. So people are actually working in the NHS. Also, the HS2 project, Love You or Hate It, the class is key workers. So we're doing a lot of housing of those, of those um, engineers, workers across the West Midlands. And currently there's about 2,000 staff and we're, we're housing about 10% of that workforce. But on the residential side, we've seen a lot of, we've seen rent collection pretty much stay flat. So we haven't really felt the pinch of rent collection and we have a lot of stock. We have, in terms of units, we have about 200 units. So we still seen the growth in those areas because just before COVID, we increased our rent, not knowing COVID was gonna happen, but a lot of our tenants haven't been impacted. And the good thing about a lot of our, our customers we are housing, the government has introduced a lot of packages and measures which has really benefited a lot of our, our uh, uh, customers. And I suppose one way it, it kind of impacted us in a way, because a lot of people rely on, or working from home are relying so much on technology. So we've had to increase the capacity of our technology in our, in our real estate, but at the same time, provide furniture for them to work with. And also making sure, because some of our stock is pretty much service, we've had to stop a lot of our staff going into service these real estate. But at the same time, we've employed some of our customers to help us with the maintenance which has worked really well but at the point in time looking across the industry there's going to be a lot of casualties especially in the retail space because retail tra your traditional bricks and mortar are well positioned where you have a lot of high foot forward and traffic and what happens when the traffic goes away they become bottomless and if you look at historically on the high streets they've been before covid came into play you've had they've been going through a lot of challenging times because a lot of people don't really go to the high street and you can imagine COVID based on where we are is more like the the final name in the coffin so there's gonna be a lot of empty retail spaces as well as hospitality um I don't know how that's going to work when everything comes back to normal it's going to take a long time for sure mm -hmm. and if you look at office space you know um a lot of people are looking to work from home and implementing things like social distancing I don't know how that's going to work in in practice because you have you know 
um, shared spaces like you know bathrooms and kitchens and canteens and what have you. So it's going to be quite tricky for for a lot of um, companies, or especially commercial real estate, so retail, hospitality, and and um, um, just office as a whole. But I think on the residential side, I think there's still going to be a lot of opportunities because um, there's going to be a lot of I think and and there's going to be a lot of resurgence of people wanting to work from home rather than going to, to office spaces there'll be more people going back into residential space uh, houses and setting up offices in there rather than um, going back into your traditional office space and one thing we're starting to find now is in across the whole industry there's been abundance of capital so a lot of people are not putting capital to work everyone's just trying to wait to see what's happening and that's one thing we're doing as a business it's just trying to see it's, it's week seven or week eight so we're still, still waiting to see where the opportunities present themselves because there's so much money and the government the, gov, the government as a whole has thrown in a massive you know amount of liquidity in the economy and what's going to happen is there's going to be so much liquidity, it's going to be very hard for people to put capital to work. But having said that, in the next few years, we will start to see a lot of these opportunities. But I think it's so early, it's very early in the, state, in, in the, in the day to, sit, to, to, to kind of really see where those opportunities are. But what we're currently doing as a business is working very closely with businesses. So one of our biggest clients is the HS2. Like I said, we're housing just over 200 workers. I'm really looking to do more with them. Um, in this current climate, when there's so much, when, if you look at the recession, but the, we are currently in a recession, if I'm allowed to say that, infrastructure projects like HS2 will stimulate the economy because in the construction space, a lot of, peop a lot of people will feed off that, that massive um, infrastructure project because we see a lot of people that need housing, we see a lot of uh, construction workers being, being employed. A lot of people, um, as one of the panelists was saying, in terms of acquiring these SKUs to kind of really fulfill these projects. So from a business perspective, there's not a lot of changes per se, but I know the change is going to come once the restriction has been um, lifted. Oh, thank you, Coyote, and, uh, for that briefing. So if, if, I, if I borrow your, your word about recession and go back to Paul, Paul, as an economist, I don't know if you can hear me. Paul? <clears throat> yes, if I borrow Coyote's word as an economist, I don't know if we can call a recession is here with us or are we already in a recession? We're heading to a depression. So there's been so much uh, uh, discussion going on about UK GDP falling uh, to about 30, 35, going back into the 60s. But for a business that at the moment is planning to re-enter the market, or to, re, to reinvent into the new economy. How do you see the in absence of uh, robust facts data, because I know the, the environment is very fluid and fragile. How do, you, where do you, how do you see the economy in the next few months, in the, the years to come? Where do you see the opportunities are for businesses and entrepreneurs that are looking to reinvent or enter into the market? or re re reorganize themselves for growth? Well, I think the, the first thing to point out is it, it, it's, it, it's the largest recession probably ever recorded in Britain. But if you're used to African GDP growth rates or GDP volatility, it can be in the 1960s and 70s, it was quite normal to have huge volatility in your, in your exchange rate. So the first thing is economies will, will change and transform. We are looking at something like a contraction, I don't know, probably of, of about 35% in the first half of the year, which is enormous. I mean, the British get upset when it contracts 0.2%. So it, 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 we need new graphs now to explain what's going on. The Bank of England and everybody seems to think there's something called a V-shaped recovery um, in the second half of the year, but even even if you had the strongest growth rate that was ever recorded, it's difficult to see how, how the, there's going to be real growth. It's going to probably take about five or six years for the economy to return to the level it was at in 2019. And even then, it's important to remember that that was a difficult period, um, that the economy was starting to slow down. It really depends on how you manage it. And from, from an African experience, you can see that some countries can successfully manage transition, other ones can't. It's really, the British are being confronted with a problem they've never had to do, is how to actually stabilize the economy. It's not just a, 
simple method of trying to stimulate the economy, you've got to actually try and protect the fabric of the economy. And we're looking at something, the economy is probably only performing about 30% at the minute. And I'm a bit concerned about people saying that everybody's going to be able to work from home. If you look at the labor force in the West Midlands, something like a fifth of the labor force or about um, half a million people actually work in the production sector. You can't actually build a car f or you can't actually build an airplane from w working remotely. Similarly, there's about 30% of the labor force work in what could be called societal, which is healthcare, uh, um, education, and just public administration. It's difficult for those people to work at home. And then, then you've got the, uh, the distribution sector, and it's difficult to, to drive a lorry from home. And so I'm just worried about this, this attitude that we're going to actually go and all work remotely. I would reckon the, if you'd be lucky, if about 10 or 20% of the workforce can actually work remotely, and we've got to look at, at other ways of actually getting people into manufacturing and into distribution. One of the things we will be seeing is that this is the fourth interruption to global supply chains that we've had since 2008. We had the, the collapse of global supply chains and global trade in 2009 and 2010. Then we had the volcano in uh, Iceland that interrupted global supply chains. Then we had the tsunami in Japan, which meant that some car companies couldn't operate for about three or four weeks or produce anything because of problems. Now we've got a fourth interruption. So I think what people will be looking for is proximity manufacturing, where actually a lot of the, the components are much more sourced locally. So that could be some potential growth. The big question is, is about automation. I think people have got the wrong end of the stick on this one. Um, the number of robots per 10,000 workers in the UK is 91. The international average is 1999. Germany has about 200 and sorry, Germany has 340 robots per 10,000 workers. South Korea has 770 robots per 10,000 workers. And even Denmark and Sweden are in the two or 300 per, per 10,000. They haven't had mass unemployment. It's the structure of the British labor market that probably causes mass unemployment and temporary contacts and very, very limited, um, not senior workers as capital. And I think we will see a big transition and we will actually create more jobs through automation. It's just we're a little bit behind the curve. And the big problem there is lack of public sector investment in regional infrastructure and particularly into broadband. So there are opportunities, but what we're waiting for is for the government to actually realize what the economy looks like. I get really bored when, when people say that 85% of the economy is um, service sector, when actual fact the, the production sector in, a way, in the Midlands is about a third of the economy, the distribution sector is about another fifth, and the, the financial services sector, and even nationally, is only about 7% of the total economy. And so we really need people to actually understand the structure of the economy. Ah, thank you, Paul. And of course, that, that's quite worrying in terms of uh, how do you plan ahead without clear economic statistics. And uh, probably if I go to people who teach entrepreneurship and the creativity, Damboka and the peers, if I'm an entrepreneur looking to create solution for the future, but they, they, as you can hear from Paul, the economy is, we are, we are planning in the dark. We don't know how next year will look like. As an entrepreneur who look to be more creative, creative, create opportunities for the new new economy, what what are, what are things should I consider? How would that what would be the scenarios to make sure that we are positioned competitively and of course manage some of the unknowns? Because clearly from Paul, there's quite a lot of unknowns, and you can see every day there's new announcement, new changes. The situation is very fluid. Well, you just have to watch the BBC at five o'clock every night to see how <laughs> clueless the government is. They don't even know how many people is dying. <laughs> Damboka, what's your thought? And then we can hear from Piers also. As what, an I, hmm? what I would say is um, one of the characteristics of, uh, of an entrepreneur is to be able to, uh, to work, uh, to tolerate, I mean, uh, ambiguity. 
So you can never be certain about anything. That's why entrepreneurs have to take, uh, to take some calculated risks. Uh, it's keeping eyes and, and ears open for opportunities. Where others see a problem, entrepreneurs would see an opportunity there. Uh, so the point I'm making here is, even though we may not know uh, what tomorrow holds, what the future holds, but you have to keep planning uh, and uh, look at the trend, the way in which the world is moving. For example, we can see uh, that there's now a lot of uh, emphasis on, uh, on digital and IT support services in terms of businesses. We can see a lot of things going that direction. So as entrepreneurs, it's kind of uh, trying to go through the direction in which things are flowing. And it also entails having to redefine and having to remodel the business models because we are living in uncertain times. So a business model that worked in the past or that is working now may not necessarily be the business model that works uh, tomorrow. For example, the streams of revenue, where are they going to come from? Are you going to rely on one stream of revenue or not? Um, and one of the things that I can give an example of uh, is we have seen recently big companies, not even small businesses, big companies that were reluctant to uh, do a lot of online uh, things. For example, our delayed, they were not into online uh, supermarkets, but they've started to do that now. And I see that there's no going back in that. So what then that means is as an entrepreneur, you look at what is happening in the world and you try to focus, you know, having to have your crystal ball and try to see, okay, what do you think uh, would happen uh, one year from now? And then try to work around that. So it, 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 it's a difficult balance, but unfortunately it's a characteristic that entrepreneurs Normal entrepreneurs have that kind of innate uh, characteristic that is uh, in them being flexible, being adaptable, uh, being opportunistic, and always, of course, being creative uh, and innovative in the way they do business and do things uh, in different ways in order to remain uh, afloat and to remain competitive. Yeah. Uh I, I think, yeah, I, I, I go along with most of that. I think, I think one of the, um, one of the things about creative processes is that they is it's a question of scale very often. Um, and if you are agile and you are going to discover and exploit new opportunities, uh, create something new that hasn't been done before, uh, almost always that uh, is down to noticing a difference, a gap, um, and beginning smalls, uh, you know, creativity starts with one or two people having an idea and talking to each other. And I think it's the scale which makes organizations agile. Large organizations always struggle with change and they always struggle with innovation. Um, uh, and their business models generally, uh, you know, innovation is the enemy of profit in many ways. Um, if you want to make a profit, then you, you find something which is, you, uh, is sells well, uh, specialize in it, uh, do it at large scale with great efficiency and you'll make more money. Um, if you're going to innovate, you've got to start small. Um, and often opportunities uh, are because they're high risk, you don't want to invest huge amounts in them. So uh, uh, I think looking around to see what is already emerging, because what the shape of the new businesses that are going to be dominating the world in 10 years' time, uh, they've probably already started. Uh, there will be one or two people somewhere who are working away at something which is going to turn out to be the thing that eats us all. Um, uh, and if you can see it already now and you're thinking about it, it's probably not the innovation you're looking for. So uh, my advice would be to really, really listen, really, really look around and see what's hap already happening rather than trying to make a kind of you know, uh, educated guess about what might happen in six, 10 months, a year's time, because really nobody has the faintest idea. Um, and so it's a matter of being very conscious of the present, what's happening right here and now, we can see that might present an opportunity. The other thing I've noticed about, and it's certainly true of uh, innovation and creativity in the arts, 
is that um, great new ideas come where surprising things meet. When you get a conversation like this, um, uh, you know, when you get people who are uh, networked across Africa, um, encountering and having conversations with people who are networked across Northern Europe, and conversations about this pres the details of the differences between, say, the African experience and the European experience. Somewhere, there, those conversations may be the ones where people will be noticing um, unexpected connections, making connections which they've never made before, um, which might provide insights for potential innovation. Um, scale is crucial, I think, and I think proximal manufacturing is a really good point. And I think also we should think about the opportunity here to address some of the huge issues of climate change and uh, the other environmental issues, where the emphasis is on, you know, scale. Uh, can we use leverage, notice opportunities where um, we can bring about, use this crisis to locate the emergent, you know, in emergencies, things emerge. Find out what they are. That would be my tip. Thank you, Piers. If I go to George now, clearly, Piers just lays the issues about uh, corporate companies struggle with innovation and agility, and the, the, some of it is attributable to the uh, boardroom issues, especially when it comes to director, agile, uh, very rigid directors and things like that. And also inclusiveness. We've, we've had so many years that inclusive leadership promote creativity and innovation, but in the UK, inclusiveness in the, in the boardroom has been lacking for a long time. How do you see the business of the future look like? Are we likely to see a change in the corporate governance in the UK? Is, it likely, is there going to be a change in the mindset to attract more inclusiveness, to also encourage creativity and agility to, to, to facilitate fast decision making? Because sometimes steering a, a corporate company, it's like steering an elephant. It takes a, quite a lot of effort to, to, for one decision to be made. What's your thought and how do you see the future look like? Um, I think I'll start off with diversity in the boardroom. And, and if I tackle it in terms of three generations of governance, the first generation back in the 90s, where we had Maxwell, and what we wanted to do there is get independent people on the board. That was where the diversity came in. Just as long as you've got someone with a little bit of different experience. When we move into the 2000s, and I call that generation two, we start looking at functional diversity. So finance person, legal person, HR person. But where we've got to get to, and we're not there yet, because we've talked about age, gender, and ethnic diversity. You'll know about the Parker Review. Um, and Davis was the first one for women. We'll, we know about all these reviews. But where we're not getting to is having all of those diversities, functional, independence, cognitive, as well as age, gender, and ethnicity. So it's getting the talent from a number of different areas and having a different type of thinking. So I don't think we're anywhere near close to that at the moment in the boardroom. It's a challenge for most organizations, even getting those things like gender and ethnicity sorted. We're nowhere near the mark. And then to even think about bringing talent in from other areas of the business. And particular, and it's interesting, Eugene, you put um, about VUCA when you started off today. And I want to move us from VUCA to what I call VCAS. Sorry, can you hear okay? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So I want to move us from VUCA to what I call VCAS. Um, so we talk about a virtual boardroom. We talk about info and biotech combining. Uh, we talk about convergence. So we, we're at a time where with the speed of technology, with the different types of technology and all the things we're working on and converging at the same time, we can see a rapid development. And my A of my VCAS is about analysis. I talked about that before, but we've got big data, we've got machine learning and different ways of analyzing. And then finally around security, facial recognition, in fact, I told you I do a lot of work in the Middle East. They've got a robot now, um, the first citizen of Saudi Arabia, which is a robot helping to use technology um, in the way that we expect it to be done. 
So where do I see the new boardroom? I see the new boardroom taking some kind of control over the types of people that need to be on the board. Um, and my colleagues are talking about getting diversity on the panel tonight, about getting diversity from different sources. I think that's going to be really important. And our governance structures, I'm already seeing starting to change. So we traditionally we meet boards meeting on a bi-monthly basis sometimes with a committee meeting in between. And in this new virtual world, I found that certain committees have had to be stopped meeting. The boards are probably meeting more regularly. The meeting structures have changed and the way boards get assurance that things are correct and they can get confidence is having to change as we've got a new virtual reality. So in terms of where boards are going to be in the future, I think structures are going to have to change dramatically um, and boards are going to have to be more flexible. The way they take decisions is going to have to change. The people that populate the boards is going to have to change and then the analysis and where we get the talent from and leadership is going to have to change as well. So, and that's what I'm seeing currently. Oh. Oh, thank you, Georgia. And of course, we can't talk about uh, businesses, organization without people. So if I go to Rochelle and Diane, especially, you've had some, um, some of the comments from Paul that he does not agree many people can work from home. I think 10 to 20% can only work remotely, the rest. And also, as, as an organization, as we emerge from the lockdown, there'll be a lot of people management issues ranging from anxiety, mental health, of course, a lot of uh, concern in terms of behavior or stability in the workplace. How do you see the future people management strategy goes and do, well, do you agree also with Paul that not, not only a percentage of 10 to 20 is able to work remotely or is there any an alternative way already businesses at the moment are looking to either have half of their workforce working from home but there have been already some concern of allowing people working from home no, no assessing their the situation, the environment at home. Of course, not everybody has the conducive environment. I've been talking to some business leader who's been told, um, highlighting that some of the employees share rooms or share flats or families, so many kids, it's been challenging to work from home. How do you see remote working and also managing people's behavior and mental health and the well-being moving forward? Um, I think it's going to be a, a big concern um, and I agree um, with my fellow speaker that a lot of people can't work from home and this causes them more anxiety. Um, the problem is before um, COVID-19, the mental health services are stretched beyond, you know, there's over years of waiting lists um, and this is only going to add to this. Um, I also think because all companies are going to be going through this and they should be having some sort of returning to work um, assessment for their workers. It's going to further um, reduce their workforce due to the this um, issues they're all having. I mean, from, from us, we're getting calls from all different types of individuals who are really concerned concerned obviously for their job because um, some companies are looking at reducing their workforce and thinking that people can work for, from home more um, efficiently. Um, but like your colleague says, um, a lot of people can't work from home. They're going to have to go back, but a lot of them are anxious just about, you know, learning to social distance, um, how is that going to how is that going to be set up when they literally physically go back into work? Um, there's so many things that we have to consider. I mean, I I'm, I run a private practice, so um, but even for us, we're just absolutely stretched, and people cannot afford a lot of the services, and this is where the NHS have to come in. But when you don't have enough people to actually deal with the amount of people who are, are leaning on the services, 
it's going to be a big problem. Um, and to be honest, I don't have the answer because I just don't know where you find many of these practitioners all of a sudden to be able to take on these additional cases when before lockdown we were stretched. Yeah. Uh, Rochelle, what's your thought in terms of feature remote working? And if you can touch also in terms of the giga economy, because I think your organization or businesses will be looking to engage people on a flexible basis to give the room to, in the case the situation changed, they can easily adapt, downsize, or whatever, outsource, outsource skills on the go. What's your thought on that? Yeah, um, I would say with regards to um, Paul's comment in terms of some persons can't work in remotely, I very much agree and it, it fits with the statistic of um, that shift from 44% um, to 80% remote working. Um, there is there is that population that they will struggle. Uh, well, the, the nature of the job doesn't quite permit for remote working. And as in terms of the future of those jobs uh, and whether or not we will get to a point of technology where um, all, all persons can work remotely. I, I definitely don't think that is the case. Um, one of the things that we do need to consider though is in that context where persons who can't work remotely are losing their jobs, how do we um, support those individuals and what happens to that now an unemployed workforce? And I think one of the things that's gonna happen is a lot of um, persons who find themselves out of work are going to turn towards the gig economy and online sources of work and um, more multiple streams of income through the digital economy that's, that's there and that's set up. So I think that's one possibility. Um, well, that's a trend that's already showing. And the other thing I think we need to remember is um, in terms of a lot of the changes that we're seeing on the current context, um, the business context 10 weeks ago was already in a state of unprecedented times. We were already in a state of um, disruption and now heading towards um, heading into the situation that we are in now where we've gone from um, disruption to disequilibrium this unbalance of um, just just the entire context in our sort of business ecosystems so I do think that it's gonna require a lot of innovation when it comes to human capital management especially when you're thinking about um, how do you manage persons um, not just that would have um, let's say in the past work primarily within the workforce, primarily within the organization, but those now working online and offline, the human and robot and so forth. But as many colleagues have said as well, that consideration for those who remote working doesn't quite suit and what do we do to support those persons? And a lot of companies, they've, they've gone from this this sudden shift to remote working, not thinking of the, the impact um, that that's had on the on the mental health. So now I think one of the things we're going to see is we're going to have a population with um, a, a massive PTSD population mm -hmm. where persons are recovering from the shock of that sudden shift and what that means for their daily lives and, and personal circumstances. So I definitely with regards to um, human, human resource management, or I, or I should say human capital management, it needs for more, um, there's, there's a need for more intuitive leadership, that sort of consideration for what your individual employees need as opposed to trying to, to manage via sort of blanket policies where it comes to HR and people management. We need more sort of flexible and in, intuitive policies that allow us to adjust to the situations of individual persons. And definitely within the, the gig space, one of the things that our research highlighted was that um, our organizations were losing a lot of independent work worker or independent contractor talent because um, of their inability to supply um, or to manage those workers effectively so we're seeing a lot of persons in that gig space demanding more let's say retainer contracts to avoid that exploitation in that digital space we're also hearing a lot of digital workers complaining of discrimination within the digital space and when we're talking about diversity and inclusion we tend to focus on um, the, the effects of that on that sort of traditional population, not so much the online population. So we're finding a lot of independent workers choosing to cut ties with companies for that reason as well. And also a lot of those sort of workers typically aren't recognized for the work that they do. So you find an independent worker would complete a piece of outstanding work um, in a team that he's working with and never acknowledged for that work at all because they're not really seen as a part of the team, but more seen as an ad hoc resource or a thing, <laughs> an online app, 
as opposed to a person. So it definitely needs for a cultural and a mindset, mindset shift in the way that we think about work and the way that we think about our, our talent and how we go about managing that workforce. So I think it, it needs for a complete um, review and um, revision or redevelopment of the way we look at people management. Hmm. Could I uh, add just something on mental health? Yeah. When when the um, when the tsunami hit the Fukushima um, nuclear power reactors, they were terrified that it was going to cause mass radiation sickness. And the Japanese reconstruction agency now calculates that possibly one person can be attributed to have died from radiation poisoning. But because of the evacuation, 2,000 people died of stress-related diseases caused by the evacuation or committed suicide. And that's one of the things that the government hasn't really picked up on. That they, they just assume everybody's relaxed at home. But if you, if you can't pay the mortgage, you can't pay for the car, and you can't pay for the food, then, I mean, one of the big examples is the preschool meals. The, the system isn't working because the government order gave it to two smaller company. So I don't think the government's actually woken up to the, to the real mental health dimension that just this lockdown period is going to cause. Yeah. So clearly mental health will be a big issue. And, and of course, also for, uh, to support Rochelle, if now no employee can make an excuse that they don't have the facility to, to provide the remote working or home working flexibility moving forward. Uh, if I go to Coyote, as you can hear from some of the majority of our speakers, clearly the future will be different. And already companies are talking about downsizing, realigning their operation, which means that we'll have implication in terms of asset and facility. So that means there's an office space. Some of them will not be used or whatever. And of course, in home, home, home uh, housing also will have to change for certain people who want to work from home. How do you see the, the property market development and the, uh, is likely to shift? And in terms of using some of the city space and the infrastructures? Right, we're starting to see a lot of changes. For example, one of our, um, one of our retail units is, is run by a local pizza shop. Now, 70% of his revenue came from pizza, pizza orders. So people actually going to his retail um, shop to place orders for pizza. 70% of that revenue is gone because a lot of people are actually going in there and he didn't have the capability um, to kind of fulfill a lot of um, home delivery. So what he's actually done, realizing he has a really good oven, he's starting to make uh, PPP equipment. So his oven, he's starting to use that to, to make um, some shield uh, mask for, for um, NHS workers. And that's really, really picked up. But you start to find a lot of people like him are being more resourceful and implement, implementing economy of scope rather than scale. But it's just, as, as, as Professor Pierce was saying, is he's, he's picked that niche and he's starting to deliver a lot of PPP equipment to um, a lot of um, key workers. Now, the only thing we've seen is a lot of these office spaces um, they're, they're starting to reintroduce a lot of shift pattern work. So people that need to go into the office, they're starting to see there'll be more like a, a, a three days in the office, two days from home, and it'll be a vice versa. So just to enforce the social distancing. So that's another change that's coming into play. And also on the, on the digital side of things, a lot of people are starting to change the current like i'll give an example one a michelin restaurant in birmingham they never delivered food it was always going to dine so a lot of that, a lot of those places are starting to change the actual restaurant itself and that's becoming more like a distribution center where they they start to you know mobilize and uh, um, a lot of the resources internally and to kind of, kind of fulfill orders um, to people's door, door, doorsteps. And you tend to find a lot of warehouses now, they're starting to consolidate and, and strip out a lot of waste. People are starting to realize there's a lot of space they've, they've been having, but they actually need this space. So we've seen a lot of people in the warehousing space downsize. And what's funny in the residential side, um, a lot of people are starting to think long-term and how do we make sure we, we help people become more flexible how do we make sure we incorporate things like um 
very working conditions for people that, that, that want to work from home? How do we, you know, change and incorporate the places like nurseries? I'm trying to see a lot of developers now thinking of having nurseries just down below uh, um, an apartment block. Another thing people are starting to do is in the massive, in the massive um, development um, estate just happened not too far in Birmingham, they're starting to look at introducing nursery in, in this, in this um, uh, uh, estate. So a lot of developers and construction workers are starting to think differently and work very closely with the, with the actual uh, industry to see what we can do to accommodate some of these changes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. So I've been going through some, some question that has been submitted but i think some of them has been answered but i think uh, dennis had uh, a few questions to to maybe to pass to the panel dennis oh. yeah there's there's um maybe this one is um and i think one of the panelists talked about it very briefly prior to the pandemic we had you know huge globalization happening and uh Africa has always been on the back foot of this kind of globalization until China got into the mix and tried to engage Africa more from a raw materials point of view, but also trade was beginning to move between the African continent and the Chinese uh, peninsula side of things. Uh, but prior to that, you saw, especially with Brexit, uh, with the China-US trade warfare, you saw some element of deglobalization. Uh, where countries are beginning to almost look within uh, as, 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 as a way of being sufficient in terms of uh, uh, a number of things. But then, of course, when you start looking at things like uh, global supply chains, you realize that for very many reasons, um, most of these countries are not sufficient, certainly in terms of raw materials and other things. And one of the other uh, words that I've been looking at is the this word localization. So basically the practice of conducting businesses according to both local and global considerations. I wondered what the panel thought regarding this debate between globalization, deglobalization, and localization. Uh, how are countries and uh, as, uh, as well as companies and even individuals at a personal level, when, whether you're looking at uh, higher education institutions, um, how 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 is this going to play out? This debate between globalization, deglobalization, and localization. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you, thank you, Dennis. That's a good question, especially if you take into consideration Britain could not manufacture PPE and all those things. So uh, yeah. probably, who wants to go? No, no, Britain could manufacture PPE. It's just the government chose not to select them. If you'd had a local response, you have a. The, people forget the size of the manufacturing sector is still quite large in, in the region and it is the fifth largest manufacturing country in the world. We could have manufactured it if the government had done a different procurement pro program. Yeah. Damboka, you wanted to say something or who else want to answer this question? Yes, what I wanted to, uh, to just quickly comment on it was to, uh, to say, I'm sure we are all familiar with the, you know, with the old adage that uh, China uh, is the factory of the world. And uh, if we remember also very well, uh, one of the things that put Donald Trump into office was America first. And so what we are likely to see uh, post uh, COVID-19 is there's going to be a lot of emphasis on self-sufficient. Uh, so that is going to kind of de-accelerate the pace of globalization when countries will start to look at themselves first before they look out there. Uh, just as Paul has just said, uh, we've just seen it with, uh, uh, with the PPEs. We just had, I think it was today, that uh, you know, the long-awaited delivery of PPEs from, uh, was it from Saudi Arabia? From Turkey. 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 Yeah, from Turkey. That came, is not going to be used because it is not of uh, the required standard. So that's already a waste. So what we are going to see is uh, we're going to see quite a lot of uh, initiative by entrepreneurs uh, trying to uh, trying to manufacture goods uh, like um, health-related equipment, uh, product services uh, locally, and the government, not only the UK government, but the governments around the world are going to look inward more than they have been doing in the past. 
That's that's yeah. my view considering what is happening now and the challenges of acquiring some of the medical equipment that we've been uh, looking for. That self-reliant is better than being more reliant on uh, uh, outside the country, outside the country. So the acceleration of the global of globalization. Yeah, I think I think Piers want to say something. I don't know if you want to say something, but yeah. sorry. <coughs> Globalization, localization is is profoundly problematic. I think it's a change that um, people would like to see. I mean, I was active with um, the Friends of the Earth and the environmental movement back in the seventies, um, early eighties, and the, the the slogan then was "Act local and think global." Um, and certainly, localization, diminishing distance traveled certainly in the northern europe you can see that um there are some lessons that we could get from the lockdown as to the possibility of that the grounding of all of the uh you know cheap air flight that's i wonder whether that's something which we could we could we've discovered we might be able to do without um how we redeploy all the people in those industries i don't know uh it's profoundly difficult to think about how you really square that if you're going to have um, any kind of manufacturing at scale. In the end, supply chains go from uh, raw material to product and those, those chains stretch across the world. And if you're producing product in volume and scale, then you have a globalised economy. Um, it doesn't all have to be. So perhaps there is a way in which the balance of power wealth resources can shift um i don't know how it can be done i think it has to be done but i think in the end that, that what we're seeing in the lockdown and maybe we have to accept if we're going to seriously address the issues of climate change is that everybody simply has to have that in the west has to have far less than they've got I think, let me ask this question to Paul, and then we can, oh, Carl, you wanted to say something? Paul, uh, one, one, in terms of globalization, of course, we've seen some of the behavior within the government within, during Brexit. We were talking about Brexit and some of the contracts instead of being given to British company like printing UK passport given to Delalu, We've seen some of the construction of certain things given to Bombardier and other things. Is it that the UK government do not ha have trust in some UK companies to, to give those opportunities abroad, like now outsourcing a PP from Turkey? I know one of uh, my colleague who's a businessman in Birmingham rearranged his manufacturing facility to do PP, but he's struggling to get any any purchase from NHS because the government has not been keen to, to, out, to outsource from them. What would it take to shift that mindset to support local UK businesses? Well, I think the, the big problem is to successfully deal with any pandemic. You've, you've got to have a local community response. Obviously, there's got to be some coordination at a national level. But if, if, if what, 98% of your companies are less than 50 people, and probably about 70% of, of your companies are less than 15 people, then you need, you need really look, look at, to look at it locally. I, I don't think that China is the workshop of the world, maybe the assemblage point of the, of the world, and there's a misnomer about what this globalization really is. If you look at an Apple iPhone, um, say an Apple iPhone used to cost about $400 to, to, to produce, something like $200 is, is intellectual property owned by Apple in the United States, something like $196 of the rest of it are components sourced from elsewhere in the world because they're highly specialized. And the Chinese only add about $4 of value to each Apple iPhone. And so what, what Industry 4.0 allows work, it doesn't, you don't need uh, volumes of scale anymore. Industry 4.0 with the Internet of Things allows you to come up with much more bespoke solutions that apply locally. And I think the problem, the, the current iterization of globalization has been the, the benefit of, of uh, multinational corporations benefiting from arbitrage between local labor rates. 
Mm. What we need to look at next is a new form of globalization that actually benefits people and to specific economies. And we're yeah. going to one of the benef potential benefits from Brexit is that you could have a much more uh, open relationship with Africa based on trade and actually trade things where Africa has a comparative advantage in it. It seems a bit stupid that you produce chocolate in in Belgium in and in um, in in Birmingham rather than producing the chocolate in the Ivory in Cote d'Ivoire and in, in, in Ghana, and you could all use all of the free gas that they currently flare off in the Nigerian oil fields to produce a massive industrial revolution there. But you know, these are the things that we can start talking about now. I think when we're talking about what's happening to the economy now, one of the people that actually gives a model to look at it is Amartya Sen, who looked at the incidence of poverty and famine, famine in Africa and Asia. And it's what it is, it's a certain, it's not necessarily entrepreneurs, it's people that are located in two economies at the same time. As you move from a subsistence economy to a cash crop economy, some people are operating in both economies and those will succeed. And similarly, or not as desirably, when you saw the collapse of communism, you saw people that were operating both in a centrally planned economy and to a more capitalist market oriented one, and those were the ones that were successful. Yeah. So I think the companies that will be successful or the people that will be successful is the one is to manage to grasp the potential of the internet internet of things and manufacture industry 4.0 but that's where we need to that's where the new jobs will come from and the and the actual smaller working so you might not if you, it's actually happening now in shropshire and in in, in staffordshire with design companies living in small rural areas and actually designing quite complex components that get sold around the rest of the world Great, com great comment. Of course, we are talking about globalization. We have not even uh, mentioned anything to do with food supply chain. The current is and everyone's rather, as part COVID-19, quite a lot of concern in terms of food supply chain being disrupted and the lots of worries in many economies. But in the interest of time, because we are running out of time, let me take one question from one of, I think, Linus, Dr. Linus, you had a question from the panel and then we can wrap up because it looks like we've gone. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask my question. And I like the, the answer about the supply chain that was explained a time ago. But um, I'm thinking about within a global concept and within UK manufacturing, there is a push for company to actually move from cultural transformation move from product-based business model onto a solution and service-based business model, just like the power by the hour for Rolls-Royce. You have the 3D print as a service for HP, Motability as a service. And most companies are trying to adopt this model that you pay for what you use. But if we, with the current pandemic, the risk, for this business model was actually moved from the end user to the customer or the manufacturer of that product. But with the pandemic, how can this be feasible and for the manufacturer to minimize that risk as a feasible, feasible business model, servitization? Anybody want to touch on servitization? Well, I, well we've written quite a lot about it. Um, and it basically, it's, it's, if you look at modern manufacturing now, um, it's not just the sale of a product, but it's a sale, a sale of a whole range of ancillary services. So if you look at a company like um, Rolls-Royce, when planes are flying, they make something like 50% of their turnover from services, such as the maintenance of the, of the engines and a whole range of things. And, and the Germans have called, them, called this uh, sector connected industries and its service sector uh, enterprises that are wholly or partially dependent on the manufacturing sector. And that's where the real growth area is going to be is the development of industry 4.0. There's a few reports on it on our website if people want to have a look at it. Yeah. Oh. Anybody else who want to add on that or? No. I think in the interest of time, probably we can wrap up with the last question 
if you just take a few, just one or two minutes, to, is about capturing the next frontier as we move to the new economy or the new norm, or if it's called the new norm or already the new norm or the new world. What are the key things to, to consider to, to, to what are the best strategy guidance would you give to entrepreneurs or, or businesses to consider as we wrap up? What will be the key tools, the key skills, or key consideration moving forward into the new frontier? I think so. Probably we we start with who want to start first. You don't mind going? Okay. Um, I th I think one of the first things I suggest is that we don't react in this environment. We don't respond to everything that's going on. We do have to be proactive and make sure we make decisions and be agile. But we need to spend a little bit of time now as businesses and entrepreneurs to survey what's going on before we make those final decisions. And there's going to be a new norm out there in a number of areas. So I predict that boardrooms are going to change. So we've started to have much more virtual board meetings. And I think in the new norm, that's going to continue. Um, I just, I'm not even traveling um, across the world, just traveling to Scotland, fly bees um, just before I was going to go, went bust. Um, I was supposed to get to a meeting nine o'clock in that morning. So I was going to be try getting on the plane, a train the day before, to get there the night before, to have a meeting for an hour the next morning, to get a train back three o'clock, to get home that evening. So for an hour, hour and a half meeting was two days of travel. So I think the new world, I'm going to be saying, no, I'm not coming <laughs> in the day's travel to do an hour and a half meeting. So I think that's a new norm. Mm. Secondly, frequency of meetings and the, the amount of information that we get in meetings is going to change also. Um, board papers already 300, 400 pages long um, and we find it in a virtual meeting. It's got to be more succinct. You've got to make sure you get your key performance indicators out there. So I think that's going to change. A couple more, yeah, the yeah, composition yeah. of the board. We're, we're expecting more diversity in the boardroom, as I said. And we're going to get talent from all over the organization. And we keep talking about fourth industrial revolution. And the generations that are competent with it, generation Y, and I'd even say X, Y, and I'll go into Z as well. Um, I won't talk about coronials, that's for another day. Um, and then we have the decision making. So decision making is going to have to be more flexible. Decision making is going to have to take on board um, different assurances. And we're not going to be able to bounce off as much the body language and the, the little silos that we have sometimes. We're going to have to get our information from different sources so we can make decisions very quickly and agile. So I think the from my perspective in the governance world, in the boardroom, there is going to be a definite new more. Some things are not going to go back to the way they were. And as an entrepreneur myself, um, I reflect back on one of the questions you had earlier about what should entrepreneurs do in this environment. I've had to reinvent myself over the last 25 years a number of times. I used to be the black accountant because that was my niche. Then I became the accountant. <laughs> then I was a national practice in Broad Street. I remember back, back in the day. And then I had to change from, I was a bit of a community activist. Um, people didn't even know I was an accountant. So I had to drop that brand as well if I wanted to make any money. And then I became the governor. So now I'm the governor, the governance expert. And guess what? I'm going to have to reinvent again. Because in this environment, I found out that, as I said at the beginning of this talk, that I've had to develop new skills, new ways of delivery. And the 80% of my core business that was there before, I don't think it will ever be 80%. It may be 30 or 40% post-corona. So I've got to find a new revenue source. And I will do that because that's what we do as entrepreneurs. Oh, thank you, Carl, for that insightful closing remark. So Damboka, what's your thought, uh, your final uh, summary in terms of what people, businesses, entrepreneurs should consider moving forward into the new frontier, new norm? Yes, my, my, my thought will be that um, we are going to see a sea change in terms of uh, our business culture. Not just uh, as much as Carl has just said, 
a big, big change in the way in which businesses are conducted. I had said earlier on um, that we're going to see more of uh, deacceleration in globalization, but for businesses themselves, for entrepreneurs themselves, as they go digital, they have to be more of a global in terms of the approach to doing business because uh, a lot of business is going to move to online. And so when you do business online, you're exposing yourself to a wider uh, audience beyond your traditional uh, customers. And this is one thing that I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, African entrepreneurs would need to actually quickly try to catch up on because the need for online uh, business is not going to go backward, but that's going to be the new norm and the new culture. So that would be my closing uh, remark, really. We are moving forward. We're not going to go back to where we were uh, before COVID-19. So it's now needed to change and uh, to change into direction and to think much more seriously about how the businesses could restructure uh, and reinvent themselves as a business and also as individuals. Great point you mentioned about African building the African and black businesses building their presence in the digital age. It's a, it's a very huge gap, especially for businesses when you go out there. Some of them don't have, didn't have any presence, any website or anything like that. So probably is a good, is a new area to look into. Piers, what's your uh, final thoughts in terms of moving forward into the new frontier? Where do you, what are the key tools we should take with us or the people on the line, what are the key tools should consider? I think if you're going forward into real uncertainty, um, you really don't know what's gonna happen. Um, so uh, it's, it's not a great idea to take the wrong map with you. Um, you're in absolutely new territory to some extent. So some of those maps that you rely on won't work anymore. And you have to look around you immediately in the small scale, the local, because that's as far as you can see. And uh, try not to uh, project what you think might be happening or should be happening onto what is happening. I've seen that a lot in the response to the COVID crisis itself. And people, um, you know, fitting, fitting what they notice into what they expect. And if you're in really new territory, you could, stuff will be happening. It'll blind you to what is happening. Um, you know, if you bring your old theories with you. So I think being alert to really watching, really looking, really listening, really putting your feelers out in your own network and paying attention to what is going on um, to see what is actually happening. One tiny example, my students are all isolated at home. I've been talking to them regularly online. My expectation was that, I, that they would all be depressed and lonely. Um, they're alone, some of them, um, but to my surprise, they don't seem to be. I was expecting them to be, but they're not. Mm. Something else is happening. Their lives are going through a really important, surprising, challenging time, but they're not responding in the way I assumed they would. Yeah. And I think that's uh, that's the thing to look out for. Yeah, thank you for that. Probably those students, they found a new way to party online. You know, now they, that's the new opportunities. <laughs> There's new, <laughs> which uh, I was surprised. There was one that was uh, hosted in Germany, was attended by one million people. Yeah. But, and, uh, which is an yeah, yeah. interesting mm -hmm. opportunity there. R Rochelle, if I come to you, what's your final thought in terms of moving forward? Uh, and they probably what will be the future skills or future as, as we go into the new frontier? I think. Sorry, I'm muted. Um, I definitely agree with the previous comment in terms of the need for serial reinvention. And I think that's gonna be one of the key skills that's gonna determine uh, who sinks and who floats, um, to put it very harshly. Um, in, the, in the new road forward. I think there's going to be a real emphasis on, on digital skills, the combination of digital and those physical human sort of skills and how human resource 
management or human capital management practitioners um, manage that is going to be very um, important to determine the 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 impact that that sorry the impact that that has on individuals. So there is going to be a new need for a, a tech and touch ecosystem where you you consider both the digital and digital and the um, human skills that are needed. In terms of the human, um, definitely we over the years um, you've heard the, the need for agility as the business environment changes and that's um, just going to accelerate. I expect to see more demand or need for more rapid, rapid pivoting when the environment or the circumstances change, especially um, as well along with that growth mindset. And where that is concerned, I think there's going to be a need for a new learning and development roadmap within organizations with regards to the approach that you take to training your employees, not just training them in particular policies or practices, but actually teaching employees how to learn and how to learn rapidly and differently. I think we're also going to see a bit more sort of bite-sized learning and more turning towards the external stakeholders as opposed to the internal ecosystem. So I think organizations will become even more networked. But I do think that there's going to be, in terms of the human skills, a need for more digital literacy, um, in terms of agility, in terms of that growth mindset, as, as well as self-leadership and self-management within that context, and the need to pivot or to, to change very rapidly. Uh, thank you, Rochelle. How about you, Diane? What's your, what's your closing thoughts and uh, especially from, from managing our mental agility to help us going through this, the unknown and the, what will be your recommendation and guidance? I think um, based on what a lot of people have said, it is um, not assuming, even from my perspective, it's also about really understanding who my customer and my avatars are and their new sense of whether it's buying power, whether it's spending ability. Um, from my business sense, I've really had to really relook really at who my customers are, what are their needs are, because they've changed because of all what's going on. Um, I think from um, a practice point of view, I think we, we're going to have to get these timescales down in the waiting list for people to be seen. I, don't, I think there's going to have to be a whole um, shake up of the system and how that works. Um, and I think businesses will really need to look at that side of their, um, um, of their employees, of the kind of um, assistance and help they require to move them through this change because yes people have had to adapt but people adapt at different rate, um, rates and I always say cultural change is one of the hardest things to um, adapt to so I just think we will see a definite spike in regards to people's mental health um, but I think it's about us re-looking at all of our systems and changing the way in, in which we um, serve um, our, our patients. But to be honest, I, I am, I'm one of these people who is just really looking and analyzing and watching because I, I, I like one of your colleagues is, I don't want to assume anything, but it's just been a, an increased rate for us. And um, the issues have always been there. It's just that they've come at a much higher level. Um, and the quantity and the amount of people we're expected to see has risen, you know, quite a lot. And I deal with all sorts of stuff from domestic violence to all sorts. So it's been a really big learning curve for me. Yeah. Thank you. Kayode, what's your closing remark in terms of how do we move into the future armed with the right tools and the strategy and the best practice? More than ever, I think businesses go back to the why, the, the why, why they're in business. I think the why is so important now. They have to go back and understand why are we in, the, in this line of work? Why are we in this business? Because more than ever, they need to go back to, to that sort of um, question. The second thing they need to do is to understand what is our business? How do we align our business, how do we align the things we need to do, which I agree with everything everyone has said on this panel, in terms of improving the capabilities and resources and lighting them back to the why, and, and making sure 
they have a very good, strong um, um, adaptive uh, supportive system. So what I mean by that is pretty much understanding the external factors and how they can translate that into practical capabilities businesses need and aligning that to the, to the why and why they're in business. And I think that's the way forward for a lot of businesses. Because there's so many businesses now, they're so confused. They don't know what to do. They need to go back to those fundamental questions, understand what is it they're trying to, what, what they're trying to resolve and how can they do that in this post-COVID um, era. Thank you, Carl. And finally, Paul, I know, I know the future is not bright and the, the very dark cloud ahead of us, but how, how can we walk through that, that crowd of, uh, without uh, robust economic data and everything and they come out strong and as winner and thrive? Hmm? I thought I'd said too much already. <laughs> I think the, <laughs> the big thing is co the COVID's going to be here for decades and whether we get a vaccine could be at least five years away and therefore we're actually going to have to sit. We were already before the crisis we're actually going to have to think about how we design our urban spaces and the artificial division between the rural and urban areas and London's shown to be impractical to actually um, host human beings because they can't crowd on the tubes anymore and if, if we can't allow people to just simply go and use cars because that'll increase the problems with the with a global environment with the, the global climate challenge and therefore we've got to have a really serious think about how we redesign our cities so that they can take on board most of the comments that have been um, said tonight that they are actually sustainable for both human beings and for the climate and so it's going to demand a massive restructuring of that but without any huge amount of money and that's where we need to look at perhaps giving more power back to local cities and to local areas rather than just concentrating it in a few quadrangles in Whitehall. Uh, thank you, Paul. I think one thing we didn't mention that, that the climate has been winning. If you look at some emission data, the, the, the environment has been performing well when people are on lockdown. On that note, we've gone beyond our time, but it's been insightful, very thought provoking, quite a lot of uh, key consideration shared to take away and digest as we move forward. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us, for sharing your, your perspective, your thoughts moving forward. And we, uh, of course, uh, we have, I've learned a lot. I hope the, the same to, to the rest of the people who on the on the panel. So we will continue. To, we are hosting similar discussion every week friday i think uh, i just want so this is, we have uh this is our schedule for the next for the next few weeks I, I think my my computer is slow this is our schedule for the next few weeks we as we we debate some of these issues that are transforming or reshaping the our future moving forward and we, we hope to see most of you in our future discussion and bring more insight into the table and perspective and thank you for your support and i and i hope you found this our discussion insightful and provoking more forward thinking as we go through we go through the current crisis and into the unknown in the future thank you so much and have a good long weekend and keep safe and well and it's been nice to to having you. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. It'll be nice to have a, a, a time at home with a bank holiday, won't it? Yes. There's no there's no difference these days between Monday <laughs> to Sunday. <laughs> have a good. Bye, everyone. Bye. Right. Thank you so much.